This is Twit. <laughs> so I think we need to talk about moon landings. Yes, we do. This has been all moon landings all week. I'm so tired, Rod. I'm so tired. Just, just tell us. <laughs> Well, okay, yeah, so so we started strong, started strong, because uh, as we're recording, this week started uh, with the Firefly Aerospace Blue Ghost moon landing, which is like a, like a, like a midnight moon landing. Uh, actually, I think it's the second link I have on here on line 22, uh, John. But, uh, but it seemed like uh, if you want to, if you if you want to talk about like a, a flawless landing, uh, having this this first attempt by Firefly Aerospace, it was absolutely spectacular. In fact, the link that we have here is a video uh, of the the descent uh, down to the plains of Mare Crisium. So it's kind of like a Mare, a, a, Mare. Oh my gosh! You know, <laughs> when the moon hits your eye like a big piece of pie, it's a Mare. Uh, and so yeah, so so they so they 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 touched down. It was very very smooth. Uh, they seem to have a, a textbook touchdown. Uh, they had uh, images. Uh, very soon, about a couple hours after the landing, and they've got this great video that we're seeing. Uh, if you're watching the the stream now, uh, as it uh, descends slowly, and then it captured this haunting picture of its um, its silhouette uh, or shadow on the surface with the moon or the Earth uh, up above. And so far, it seems like that mission. You know, it's it's a 14 day mission, the lunar day. Uh, it's been going pretty well. They've tested this vacuum sucking thing to collect regolith uh which is part of a nasa experiment it has a i think it has 10 different nasa experiments as part of the uh, clips program uh and it seems to be working great and i think that they're um uh you know they're really primed uh, for using this template for all of their future missions to the moon too so just absolutely spectacular to knock it out of the park like that and uh and the the, the views are spectacular uh not so much for intuitive machines that's the second uh, spacecraft that landed on the moon uh this week in fact it, uh, as we're recording it the landing was yesterday it was one day earlier on march 6th and they landed their athena moon lander this is line 22 or 21 uh, uh john they landed their athena lander uh at the near the south pole of the moon and this was actually a really audacious mission and if folks don't don't recall uh last year uh on in 2024 uh, intuitive machines landed their im1 odysseus moon lander uh, but it landed too fast uh, broke a leg on the way down and tipped over on its side uh, this time they had new cameras new navigation systems all sorts of stuff on it plus they had um, nasa's ice drilling prime one uh, drill they had a uh, two small rovers uh, they had a, uh, a hopping uh spacecraft called grace lots of different things plus a nokia labs uh, uh, uh cell tower uh, uh, a bunch of other stuff very audacious going to the moon south pole digging for that water ice uh, the approach seemed pretty good but they had what they think a lot of noise in their navigation radar system uh, and and they did hit the ground and tip over they don't know if it tripped over you know we don't know that yet uh, but they've got photos of of it kind of sticking legs up almost like a cartoon character uh with the the moon or the earth uh half lit earth above uh and and sadly they're in a crater which you know we know it's really harsh at the south pole of the moon the lighting angles are very very unforgiving mm. so they're not getting the power they need the batteries have run out uh they're not getting the charging that they, they need to keep the the spacecraft alive uh for the lunar day that they were hoping to get uh so it seems like that mission is over not the end of intuitive machines They've got plans for IM3 uh, next year. IM4 is in the contract, a $117 million uh, contract with NASA in 2027. So they're going to learn from this. They said that they're committed uh, to, to, to getting it, and they're going to stick it hopefully next on the next, on the next attempt. It would be interesting to have them on sometime because I would love to find out, because uh, I've been talking to a number of engineers about this and scientists, including our friend Pascal, you know, it's a very the center of gravity is high on that lander. It looks like R two D two. It looks like legs. it's high, but they said actually that it's lower on this lander than it was on the first one. Did In they? fact, it was it was, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Tim uh, Crane, uh, their chief technology officer, said during the post landing press conference that the the center of gravity is lower than it looks like, and it's actually harder for them to control because of that. But they tried to make mm -hmm. it. Uh, uh, as low as they could to keep it from tipping over. And it seems like just the rugged nature of the South Pole of the Moon worked against them this time. Well, and I also suspect they're, they're stuck with the basic bus they have. They can't do a whole lot of adaptation quickly. But if you look at, at the Blue Ghost Lander, it's very squat. It has a very yeah. wide stance. And, I mean, we learned in the 60s with Surveyor 
with that series of landings on the moon that you wanted really wide legs and a very low machine. But hopefully they'll get it right, right next time. Yeah. I Tell us so. about Starship. We're kind of tired of seeing these things streaming through the sky in pieces. Well, I heard that Starships were made to fly, but sadly, SpaceX is having trouble with their new design. Uh, yeah. So they, they, they launched Starship Flight 8 uh uh yes yesterday was it yeah it was yesterday oh my gosh everything was this week um and uh if, if you might recall uh, this is the second starship uh, of the year uh they managed the catch they caught the booster for the third time it was absolutely spectacular they seem to have that uh process down but they lost the ship again uh about 20 seconds before the end of the ascent burn mm. they lost a bunch of engines there's six different uh vacuum engines on the upper stage of starship and they started to lose a bunch about 20 seconds before they were supposed to stop burning and and then the ship just wildly careened out of control we saw it tumbling in space it did explode it showered debris again over the bahamas turks and caicos dominican republic we got sightings from them all including space.com's own uh, contributing freelancer, uh, Stephanie Waldeck, who was on vacation in the Bahamas and just watched as the debris rained down over the, the beautiful, pristine waters uh, uh, there. So, uh, you know, I heard from the FAA today that they did have to close some airspace, delay some flights for a while until that debris dissipated uh, and an investigation is underway. But it must be frustrating because this is supposed to be like the new and improved larger mm. version of Starship. It's uh, 52 meters tall. It has 25% uh, more propellant on it uh, and uh, and this is supposed to be the next evolution and they, they seem to be having problems just after separation because uh, this is a very similar thing happened uh, on the January flight too so we're gonna wait and see how they evolve and it's only been like two months between these flights uh, will it take that long will they be able to iterate uh, quicker uh, for the next one it's it's unclear uh, right now but I mean the, the booster catch they seem to have that down now uh, so, uh, so we'll have to see how that develops over time. Well, just so it's said, I mean, what they're trying to do is, is insanely hard. It's revolutionary. We haven't seen a development pace like this since the Apollo program and in more conventional approaches from aerospace, you know, these kinds of failures would engender a three year stand down and here we're, or, or a cancellation months. outright, yeah. you know, so, and, so, you know, that, and that, they're that, doing it on a fraction of the money. So this is all terribly impressive, but I, but I want to move on. Uh, the Voyagers, That's this right. is an unkind way of saying it, but the Voyager probes got their wings clipped again. They're very far from Earth. Uh, their their nuclear power batteries, if you want to call them that, RTGs, mm -hmm. are getting old. They're approaching half-life, I think. And, um, you know, they don't have much electricity left to work with, so they're starting to shut down more instruments. So each one got, I think, one more instrument shut down. Yeah, that's right. In fact, it so it was kind of a twofer of shutdowns for for the Voyager spacecraft. Voyager one and Voyager two each had an instrument shut down because if they didn't, and this is this was really surprising to me, uh, but Suzanne Dodd, NASA's uh, Voyager project manager, said that if they didn't turn these instruments off, they would only have enough power for like a few more months. Uh, on either of these spacecraft and have to declare an end of of the mission, uh, and so bad. yeah, it would be really sad. You know, they, uh, uh, you know, Voyager one and Voyager two are pretty much twins. They each have about ten different uh, experiments on them uh, to study the solar system environment, the planetary flybys that they did. Of course, Voyager um, uh, two did that grand tour that I have all these great posters around. Maybe one day I'll. I'll put them back up again, but I got them all from JPL uh, uh, for uh, 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 you know for its tour of the solar system. But both of them are in interstellar space. Voyager one uh, crossed out there in 2012. Voyager two in 2018. Uh, and you know the, the the like you said the the battery life isn't infinite. So mm -hmm. uh, they, they they turned off um, uh, Voyager two's plasma science instrument back in October, and uh, uh, and I believe the cosmic ray. So like system on Voyager One uh, was the 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 most recent. It was a uh, kind of a connection of three different telescopes to study cosmic rays, of which I'm sure there's a lot out there in interstellar space. Nothing but uh, <laughs> that's, that's the whole definition of crossing the heliopause. Yeah, um, and 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 but that system is the one that helped scientists prove that Voyager One indeed 
had left the heliosphere and was out there right. in uh, in inter, uh, interstellar space uh, back in 20, uh, uh, 2012. So it is kind of sad to see that one uh, turned off, but they are going to turn off another instrument on Voyager 2. This is the, the second one, uh, the energy charged particle instrument there. And that's what um, uh, tracks uh, cosmic rays, electrons, other ions, across the solar system and galaxy. Uh, and they're gonna, it's, it's got two different systems, but it'll help them save a bunch of power to keep the other systems going <laughs> on both of these spacecraft. All right. And finally, Secret of US Space Force X-37B space plane breaks new ground. That's right. So I, what I did I, it break and I hopefully threw... knows not knows first. <laughs> no, no. So we had a question from a reader last, uh, last Listener. episode. Your last listener, yeah. <laughs> readers on the brain. We had a question from a, a listener last episode about X thirty seven B and what was it doing, and it turned out to be a very well timed question because uh, literally today, uh, just before we started recording this, the Space Force sent out a blast to announce that the uh, X thirty seven B finally returned to Earth after four hundred thirty four days plus in space. It's back on the ground, and uh, and it seems to be doing. Okay, it landed autonomously at the, uh, under the cover of night in the wee hours of the morning at Vandenberg, um, at Vandenberg uh, Space Force Base. And, um, and this was a, a, a big mission for the Space Force because they tested uh, a new orbit. They launched it on a Falcon Heavy instead of a Falcon 9 or uh, previously to that, Atlas V. So they were able to go into a highly elliptical orbit. In fact, they released a photo of the full Earth uh, from that, that kind of the high point of their orbit, uh, and they tested aero braking with this kind of winged design. It has heat shield tiles just like the space shuttle uh, to slow it over time, which allows them to do orbital adjustments and and, and navigation uh, at a much more, uh, I guess, economical uh, rate when you take into account propellant and stuff. So they could change their their orbit or adjust it and make refinements. So they clearly seem to have gotten a lot out of this mission. They're still not saying what they were looking at or what other stuff they were doing, right? But uh, but very interesting that they were able to prove this out. It's, it'll be interesting to see if the next one launches on a Falcon Heavy. Uh, they have two uh, of these X-37Bs and they alternate them for missions. This is the seventh mission over time, not the longest. In fact, it's only longer than one other mission, the very first one, which was over 200 days. All of the other ones have been longer than this flight. So this is kind of short compared to the other ones. I think the longest was 908 days. That was the OTP-6 mission from uh, the most immediate one prior to this one.